Now, when I address the modern theories of evolution for debunking purposes, we should understand that there are different theories of evolution, or we should understand the more modern evolution theories. Like there is cosmic evolution, and cosmic evolution is a grand synthesis of all the many varied changes in the assembly and composition of radiation, matter, and life throughout the history of the universe. Basically, it is the Big Bang Theory, and the Big Bang Theory is the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. As Kent Hovind explained, evolutionists say that the Earth formed from a hot molten mass 4.6 billion years ago. They say that 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang and the Earth eventually cooled down 4.6 billion years ago and formed a rocky crust. But we have to question what exactly exploded and where did the matter and the energy come from? And as Ken Hovind further questioned, if the Big Bang produced hydrogen and some helium, how did the other 105 elements evolve? And in 2007, speaking to a crowd at the Berkeley Physics Oppenheimer Lecture, theoretical physicist and cosmologist Stephen Hawking stated that the universe was created from nothing. He said that he now believes that the universe spontaneously popped into existence from nothing without violating the laws of physics. Although they are claiming, those who are speaking in his defense, they are claiming that nothing to a theoretical physicist does not literally mean nothing. That nothingness, I guess, is more in reference to the laws of gravity and quantum physics. But I believe that it has also been stated that gravity and the laws of physics were created at the instant of the Big Bang. So, but is all of this possible? Is this possible? And can this really be proven to be factual? Can the Big Bang theory can the Big Bang be proven to be factual any easier than it is to prove or disprove that the universe had an intelligent designer or creator? Now, it has been said that the Big Bang caused the laws of physics, but there are those who believe that these laws were in existence before the Big Bang. Okay, well, is it logical for me to ask who created these laws? Because with laws, there is order or instruction. Is it illogical to believe that there was or is an intelligent designer who set these laws into motion? Well, some of you may say, well, where did this designer come from? Or who created God? And if I were to say that there was a God who created God, you just keep asking me, well, who created that God? <laughs> and this is why I believe that God represents infinity, the beginning and the end. Well, actually, he has no beginning and no end. Keeping that in mind, it keeps me from going crazy. Like when we use the word infinity to represent like the last number, if there was a last number although we know that there is no last number infinity represents what is innumerable or what is forever what is eternal well some of you may say that that's crazy illogical talk but genius Stephen Hawking believes that the laws of physics like the laws of gravity are infinite 
or that gravity has always been in existence. He believes that gravity is God and that it is basically behind the creation of all things. Now, would you say that it's more illogical to believe that gravity is behind all creation or that there was actually a creator or an intelligent designer who set, created, and organized all things, including the laws of physics, which includes the laws of gravity? Like I've said, you have some really smart people in this world who are greatly lacking in basic common sense. The Bible states at 1 Corinthians 3.19 that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11 states, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So for those who prefer to be deceived, having no love for the truth, like a lot of these so-called geniuses and know-it-alls, they're going to be sent a strong delusion, causing them to believe a lie. And remember, devil or diablos means slanderer or liar. And Satan became that lying serpent in the Garden of Eden, as the account was told in the third chapter of Genesis. You see, Eve ate of the forbidden tree, not necessarily because she was hungry. I mean, there were plenty of other trees to eat from. It was because Satan, through the serpent, had lied to her, telling her that she would not surely die. And Satan further told her that God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. And that is what tempted Eve. She wanted to be as God discerning right and wrong for herself, even though she did not create herself to even know what is right and wrong for herself. And basically that's how it is with many of these so-called geniuses today. Now it is true that to a degree, Eve's eyes were opened. Before she and Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, they didn't even realize that they were naked because it was not yet revealed to them that they should not be so exposed. They were naive as children. You see, Satan will reveal certain things to those who follow him. I mean, why do you think that Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, and Benjamin Franklin were dabbling in mysticism and occultism? Do you honestly believe that all that they had knew about photosynthesis, gravity, and electricity was just about them studying science, like, really hard? <laughs> I mean... When you examine all of the powerful worldly civilizations throughout history, like when you look at Egypt and Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, these were pagans who had all dabbled in occultism. And certain secrets have been passed down from generation to generation, and nation to nation. Now, I'm not trying to discredit their intelligence, or their efforts when it comes to um, studying and applying the scientific method, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't just obtain their knowledge through studying and applying the scientific method as some people may want you to believe. Like there are those who claim that Benjamin Franklin was an atheist, but it is a fact that he delved into the supernatural. And that wasn't just for fun, okay? But this was for that esoteric knowledge. 
Because you see, Satan will reveal, which is what these world powers have been built off of. But like certain YouTubers who y'all claim speak the truth though, Satan may reveal certain facts to you, but he won't tell you the truth or the whole truth. Yeah, Eve's eyes were open, but she did indeed die as God said that she would. You see, Satan told a little lie on that part. And this just shows that even a tiny drop of poison will contaminate the entire drink, which is why we don't want to deal with occultism or trust anything that comes from the mouth of liars who only seek to destroy us, like in YouTube. Now, I understand, however, that there are those who just do not know. And I'm not mad at those ones. There's a difference between those who know that they are being deceptive and those who just may not know. You know, they, they may not be aware of certain things. Because um, I have to admit, if I didn't know what was revealed to me from the Bible and about the Bible... I'd be on that same tip as them, casting doubts on the Bible and perhaps referring to it as the white man's book. Um, and see, we want to have that knowledge that God will reveal to us, not that so-called knowledge that Francis Bacon is talking about when he refers to um, knowledge as being power, when he says knowledge is power. You see, Hosea... 4, 6 in the Bible states, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it is important that we know that we are God's people. And what has been destroying us is our lack of knowledge. And I realize that there are a lot of people who do not know. Okay. Even many of those who refer to themselves as being pro-black. Okay, there are many of us who greatly lack knowledge, and I'm not just talking about that worldly, secular knowledge that is given to us by the Einsteins. But I will use some of that knowledge as a means of debunking their so-called knowledge or the delusion that they have put over so many of us. I just ask that you give me a chance or give God a chance who is working through me to reach you. Remember now, I am getting no money or anything like that out of this. And I actually put myself at risk sharing such information with you. But that is what having faith is all about. And obviously, it means a lot to me that you are reached and eventually saved. But getting back to science and all. <laughs> now, the universe is run by laws, like laws of gravity, inertia, etc. So is it illogical to ask who gave these laws or, or who set these laws? But as stated at realtruth.org in regards to the Big Bang Theory, we have seen that energy is continually moving into a more chaotic state with less usable energy, not into larger, more complex and organized systems such as the universe. For the universe to form in that manner, there would have to be a nearly unlimited amount of energy that started the Big Bang. This simple fact is usually ignored. And an even bigger problem is the first law of thermodynamics, often called the law of conservation of energy, which essentially states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but can only change form. So if energy cannot be created, then an incredible amount of it cannot appear from nothingness. Evolutionists understand this problem. So often focus is directed from how the universe began to an explanation of how it grew. By burying the initial creation of matter as an irrelevant point, scientists have created a series of smoke and mirrors, 
which as we have seen before, is often the best and only way to explain nearly every facet of evolution. Many scientists, such as Professor of Physics Alan Guth, if I'm saying his name correctly, have also raised the issue of ignoring the universe's origin. First of all, I will say that at the purely technical level, inflation itself does not explain how the universe arose from nothing. Inflation itself takes a very small universe and produces from it a very big universe. But inflation by itself does not explain where that very small universe came from. And theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking debunked the inflationary model, quoting in his publication, A Brief History in Time, on page 136, the new inflationary model was a good attempt to explain why the universe is the way it is. In my personal opinion, the new inflationary model is now dead as a scientific theory, although a lot of people do not seem to have heard of its demise and are still writing papers on it as if it were viable. Now, the first law of thermodynamics defines that something could not come from nothing. So by this law, science has effectively proven that if there was not an eternal God being to create the universe, there would have never been a universe. Since something can never come from nothing, then a creator had to always exist. Since a cause must be greater than the effect, an eternal maker, an all-powerful God and designer had to exist. So it's like science has proven God's existence while at the same time debunking evolution. Regardless, cosmic evolution or the Big Bang Theory is just that, a theory. Just as they claim that we did not witness the Bible account, the biblical account told in Genesis, there were no witnesses to the Big Bang. It's just a cool sounding theory. Well, for those who prefer to not believe in a creator or intelligent designer of the universe. But don't get me wrong. They've put a lot of thought into this Big Bang cosmic evolution theory. It's like they took what they preferred to believe on the origin of life, considering that they don't like the idea of a creator or a lawgiver who may direct their lives. You see, they recognize that there are laws in the universe, but they don't want to recognize or acknowledge the lawgiver. So they concoct a theory using some scientific terms and scientific facts to go along with what they would prefer to believe on the origin of life. Because like I've said, they will recognize the laws and that's where the facts are used, but they choose to not recognize the law giver. And consider some of our body organs, like the eye and the ear and the brain. All are staggering in their complexity, far more so than the most intricate man-made device. As questioned in the Jehovah's Witness publication, could the undirected element of chance that is thought to be a driving force of evolution have brought all these parts together at the right time to produce such elaborate mechanisms? Like, examine the eye. Just look at the eye. As quoted by Robert Jastro, the eye appears to have been designed. No designer of telescopes could have done better. If this is so of the eye, what then of the human brain? Since even a simple machine does not evolve by chance, how can it be a fact that the infinitely more complex brain did. Robert Jastrow concluded, it is hard to accept the evolution of the human eye as a product of chance. It is even harder to accept the evolution of human intelligence 
as the product of random disruptions in the brain cells of our ancestors. And we need to really consider the incredible cell. A living cell is enormously complex. The instructions within the DNA of the cell, if written out, would fill a 1,600 page books, explains National Geographic. Each cell is a world brimming with as many as 200 trillion tiny groups of atoms called molecules. Our 46 chromosome threads linked together would measure more than six feet. Yet the nucleus that contains them is less than four ten thousandths of an inch in diameter. When the modern theory of evolution was first proposed, scientists had little inkling of the fantastic complexity of a living cell. Newsweek magazine uses an illustration to give an idea of the cell's activities. Each of those 100 trillion cells functions like a walled city. Power plants generate the cell's energy. Factories produce proteins, vital units of chemical commerce. Complex transportation systems guide specific chemicals from point to point within the cell and beyond. Centuries at the barricades control the export and import markets and monitor the outside world for signs of danger. Disciplined biological armies stand ready to grapple with invaders. A centralized genetic government maintains order. Now, do you think that your 100 trillion cells just happened? Do you not think that this was all set up by design from an intelligent designer or creator? But is evolution itself truly scientific? And on the other hand, is Genesis just another ancient creation myth as many contend? Or is it in harmony with the discoveries of modern science? Now, from the Jehovah's Witness site, jw.org, there's a definition given for evolution or organic evolution. Now, organic evolution is the theory that the first living organism developed from lifeless matter. Then, as it reproduced, it is said it changed into different kinds of living things, ultimately producing all forms of plant and animal life that have ever existed on this earth. All of this is said to have been accomplished without the supernatural intervention of a creator. Creation, on the other hand, is the conclusion that the appearing of living things can only be explained by the existence of an almighty God who designed and made the universe and all the basic kinds of life upon the earth. Now, let me clarify that not all persons who believe in evolution theories claim to be atheists. Some persons endeavor to blend belief in God with evolution, saying that God created by means of evolution, that he brought into existence the first primitive life forms, and that then higher life forms, including man, were produced by means of evolution. However, this is not a Bible teaching. Now, I'm reading from the 1985 Watchtower Bible and Track Society publication, Life how did it get here by evolution or by creation? A current evolutionary position on life's starting point is summarized in his book, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. He speculates that in the beginning, Earth had an atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, and water. Through energy supplied by sunlight and perhaps by lightning and exploding volcanoes, these simple compounds were broken apart and then they reformed into amino acids. A variety of these gradually accumulated in the sea and combined into protein-like compounds. Ultimately, he says the ocean became an organic soup, but still lifeless. Then, according to Dawkins' description, a particularly remarkable molecule was formed by accident. 
a molecule that had the ability to reproduce itself. Though admitting that such an accident was exceedingly improbable, he maintains that it must nevertheless have happened. Similar molecules clustered together and then again by an exceedingly improbable accident, they wrapped a protective barrier of other protein molecules around themselves as a membrane. Thus, it is claimed the first living cell generated itself. And note, most other publishings on evolution also skim over the staggering problem of explaining the emergence of life from non-living matter. Now, could everything in life just originate by chance? Could undirected chemical reactions relying on mere chance create life? And is the theory of spontaneous generation scientifically valid? Can a living organism develop from non-living matter? NASA scientist Robert Jastrow, who was an astronomer, physicist, and cosmologist, stated, to their chagrin, scientists have no clear-cut answer because chemists have never succeeded in reproducing nature's experiments on the creation of life out of non-living matter. Scientists do not know how that happened. Now, respected men of science like Francis Bacon and William Harvey accepted the theory of the spontaneous generation of life. However, in 1668, an Italian physician named Francesco Redi came up with a hypothesis to disprove the idea of spontaneous generation, specifically the thought that maggots could come to life from meat. Redi set up an experiment with the control and variable groups to prove his hypothesis that flies produce maggots. In the experiment, the control group was a piece of meat in an uncovered jar. The variable group was a piece of meat in a jar covered with gauze. The gauze allowed air through, but not the flies. After a few days, Reddy observed that the control group had maggots on the meat and the variable group didn't. He then concluded that maggots only form when flies come in contact with meat and that spontaneous generation is not at play. Now, in the 1700s, an English scientist proposed that spontaneous generation was possible and performed an entirely different experiment that he suggested proved it. Later, another Italian scientist improved on that experiment and concluded that Reddy was indeed correct the first time. So, for almost 200 years after Reddy, there was still much debate as to whether or not spontaneous generation could happen until there was pasture. In 1864, chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur settled the argument once and for all. Taking the basic idea of the two scientists from the 1700s and answering critics that said air was necessary for life, Pasteur developed a special flask. It had a curved neck that allowed air in but would trap any microorganisms and not let them contaminate his findings. Pasteur showed that his flask was free from microorganisms even though it was open to the air. For a year there was no microbial growth until Pasteur broke the neck of the flask. And when microorganisms appeared he proved to the world that life could only come from other life. So, by the 19th century, Louis Pasteur and other scientists had seemingly dealt the theory of the spontaneous generation of life a death blow, having proved by experiments that life comes only from previous life. Nevertheless, out of necessity, 
Evolutionary theory assumes that long ago, microscopic life must somehow have arisen spontaneously from non-living matter. The problem for biology is to reach a simple beginning, say astronomers Fred Hoyle and Chandra Wickramasinghe. I don't know how to pronounce that name. <laughs> Fossil residues of ancient life forms discovered in the rocks do not reveal a simple beginning. So the evolutionary theory lacks a proper foundation. And as information increases, the harder it becomes to explain how microscopic forms of life that are so incredibly complex could have arisen by chance. The principal steps en route to the origin of life as envisioned by evolutionary theory are the existence of the right primitive atmosphere and a concentration in the oceans of an organic soup of simple molecules necessary for life. From these come proteins and nucleotides, complex chemical compounds, that combine and acquire a membrane and thereafter they develop a genetic code and start making copies of themselves. Now, are these steps in accord with the available facts? In 1953, American chemist Stanley Miller passed an electric spark through an atmosphere of hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor. This produced some of the many amino acids that exist and that are the building blocks of proteins. However, he got just four of the 20 amino acids needed for life to exist. More than 30 years later, scientists were still unable experimentally to produce all the 20 necessary amino acids under conditions that could be considered plausible. Miller assumed that Earth's primitive atmosphere was similar to the one in his experimental flask. Why? Because as he and a co-worker later said, the synthesis of compounds of biological interest takes place only under reducing conditions. Reducing conditions is when there is no free oxygen in the atmosphere. Yet, other evolutionists theorize that oxygen was present. The dilemma this creates for evolution is expressed by journalist Francis Hitching. With oxygen in the air, the first amino acid would never have got started. Without oxygen, it would have been wiped out by cosmic rays. The fact is, any attempt to establish the nature of Earth's primitive atmosphere can only be based on guesswork or assumption. No one knows for sure what it was like. This textbook says several billion years ago, Earth's atmosphere had no free oxygen. Well, that's just simply not true. Ozone is made from oxygen and it blocks UV light and ammonia, one of the gases needed for the experiment, is destroyed by UV light. So life cannot evolve without oxygen. But also life cannot evolve with oxygen. Well, I got a solution for that one. It didn't evolve. And by the way, the Earth has always had oxygen, even more than it does today, okay? Air bubbles are often found trapped in amber, like the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in and got the mosquito blood. These air bubbles, though, have 50% more oxygen than we do right now. We cover more on that on my video series, videotape number two, about what the pre-flood world was like and why they lived to be 900 on the blue series of tapes out there on the table. But this textbook says, the mixture at the bottom of the flask was rich in amino acids. Oh, come on, that is stupid. It was not rich in amino acids. Let's tell the kids what they really found, okay? He filtered out the product. As this gas went through the tubes, he sparked it, produced this goo at the bottom, and he drew the goo off, because if it went through again, it would be destroyed by the spark. Now, in real life, you're not going to get a section of the ocean protected. They say this just happened by chance in the ocean. We can't just, you can't filter out the product then. Secondly, what he made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid, 2% amino acids. So 98% of his mixture was poisonous to life. I would not call that a success. And there are 20 different amino acids, sort of like 26 letters in the alphabet, or 20 amino acids. Those amino acids go together to make proteins, like letters go together to make sentences. Mostly, he made just two of these amino acids. And they bond with the tar and the acid very quickly, more readily than with each other. 
It was a failure as an experiment. Amino acids are like letters of the alphabet, sort of like building blocks. You have to have a bunch of amino acids to make a protein. Then you have to have a bunch of proteins to make a cell. And you got to have a bunch of cells to make an organism. And one cell is more complex than a space shuttle. And all he got was a couple of the amino acids. That's like me dropping toothpicks, and I happen to make a few letters of the alphabet. That's possible, isn't it? Toothpicks could fall in the shape of a T, or an H, or an I, or an E. That's possible. But if I'm able to drop toothpicks and produce a few letters of the alphabet, should I therefore conclude that nobody wrote Webster's, Webster's Dictionary? The difference between making a letter with toothpicks and making Webster's Dictionary is about like making an amino acid and making a living cell. He didn't come close to making life. He made the equivalent of a few letters, and he actually needed to make huge books. Now, how likely is it that the amino acids thought to have formed in the atmosphere would drift down and form an organic soup in the oceans? Not likely at all. The same energy that would split the simple compounds in the atmosphere would even more quickly decompose any complex amino acids that formed. Interestingly, in his experiment of passing an electric spark through an atmosphere, Miller saved the four amino acids he got only because he removed them from the area of the spark. Had he left them there, the spark would have decomposed them. However, if it is assumed that amino acids somehow reached the oceans and were protected from the destructive ultraviolet radiation in the atmosphere, what then? Hitching explained, beneath the surface of the water, there would not be enough energy to activate further chemical reactions. Water in any case inhibits the growth of more complex molecules. So once amino acids are in the water, they must get out of it if they are to form larger molecules and evolve toward becoming proteins useful for the formation of life. But once they get out of the water, they are in the destructive ultraviolet light again. In other words, Hitching says, the theoretical chances of getting through even this first and relatively easy stage, getting amino acids, in the evolution of life are forbidding. Although it commonly is asserted that life spontaneously arose in the oceans, bodies of water simply are not conducive to the necessary chemistry. Chemist Richard Dickerson explains, it is therefore hard to see how polymerization, linking together smaller molecules to form bigger ones, could have proceeded in the aqueous environment of the primitive ocean since the presence of water favors depolymerization breaking up big molecules into simpler ones, rather than polymerization. Biochemist George Wald agrees with this view, stating, spontaneous dissolution is much more probable and hence proceeds much more rapidly than spontaneous synthesis. This means there would be no accumulation of organic soup. Wald believes this to be, as he's quoted, the most stubborn problem that confronts us. And when he says us, he's referring to the evolutionist. There is, however, another stubborn problem that confronts evolutionary theory. Remember, there are over a hundred amino acids, but only 20 are needed for life's proteins. Moreover, they come in two shapes. Some of the molecules are right-handed and others are left-handed. Should they be formed at random, as in a theoretical organic soup, it is most likely that half would be right-handed and half left-handed. And there is no known reason why either shape should be preferred in living things. Yet, of the 20 amino acids used in producing life's proteins, all are left-handed. How is it that, at random, only the specifically required kinds would be united in the soup. Physicist J.D. Bernal acknowledges, it must be admitted that the explanation still remains one of the most difficult parts of the structural aspects of life to explain. He concluded, 
we may never be able to explain it. And what chance is there that the correct amino acids would come together to form a protein molecule? It could be likened to having a big, thoroughly mixed pile containing equal numbers of red beans and white beans. There are also over a hundred different varieties of beans. Now, if you plunged a scoop into this pile, what do you think you would get? To get the beans that represent the basic components of a protein, you would have to scoop up only red ones, no white ones at all. Also, your scoop must contain only 20 varieties of the red beans, and each one must be in a specific pre-assigned place in the scoop. In the world of protein, a single mistake in any one of these requirements would cause the protein that is produced to fail to function properly. Would any amount of stirring and scooping in our hypothetical bean pal have given the right combination? No. Then how would it have been possible in the hypothetical organic soup? The proteins needed for life have very complex molecules. What is the chance of even a simple protein molecule forming at random in an organic soup? Some proteins serve as structural materials and others as enzymes. The latter speed up needed chemical reactions in the cell. Without such help, the cell would die. Not just a few, but 2,000 proteins serving as enzymes are needed for the cell's activity. What are the chances of obtaining all of these at random? An outrageously small probability, Hoyle asserts, that could not be faced even if the whole universe consisted of organic soup. He adds, if one is not prejudiced, either by social beliefs or by a scientific training into the conviction that life originated spontaneously on the earth, this simple calculation wipes the idea entirely out of court. However, the chances actually are far fewer than this outrageously small figure indicates. There must be a membrane enclosing the cell, but this membrane is extremely complex, made of protein, sugar, and fat molecules. As evolutionist Leslie Orgel or Orgel writes, modern cell membranes include channels and pumps which specifically control the influx and efflux of nutrients, waste products, metal ions, and so on. These specialized channels involve highly specific proteins, molecules that could not have been present at the very beginning of the evolution of life. More difficult to obtain than these are nucleotides, the structural units of DNA which bear the genetic code. Five histones are involved in DNA. Histones are thought to be involved in governing the activity of genes. The chance of forming even the simplest number of these histones is said to be another huge number larger than the total of all the atoms in all the stars and galaxies visible in the largest astronomical telescopes. Yet, greater difficulties for evolutionary theory involve the origin of the complete genetic code, a requirement for cell reproduction. The old puzzle of the chicken or the egg rears its head relative to proteins and DNA. Hitching says, proteins depend on DNA for their formation, but DNA cannot form without pre-existing protein. This leaves the paradox Dickerson raises, which came first, the protein or the DNA? He asserts the answer must be they developed in parallel. In effect, he is saying that the chicken and the egg must have evolved simultaneously, neither one coming from the other. Does this strike you as reasonable? A science writer sums it up. The origin of the genetic code poses a massive chicken and egg problem that remains at present completely scrambled. Chemist Dickerson also made this interesting comment. 
The evolution of the genetic machinery is the step for which there are no laboratory models. Hence, one can speculate endlessly, unfettered by inconvenient facts. But is it good scientific procedure to brush aside the avalanches of inconvenient facts so easily? Leslie Orgel, or Orgel calls the existence of the genetic code the most baffling aspect of the problem of the origins of life. And Francis Crick concluded, in spite of the genetic code being almost universal, the mechanism necessary to embody it is far too complex to have arisen in one blow. Evolutionary theory attempts to eliminate the need for the impossible to be accomplished in one blow by espousing a step-by-step -step process by which natural selection could do its work gradually. However, without the genetic code to begin reproduction, there can be no material for natural selection to select. An additional hurdle for evolutionary theory now arises. Somewhere along the line, the primitive cell had to devise something that revolutionized life on Earth, photosynthesis. This process, by which plants take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen, is not yet completely understood by scientists. It is, as biologist F.W. Wint states, a process that no one has yet been able to reproduce in a test tube. Yet, by chance, a tiny, simple cell is thought to have originated it. This process of photosynthesis turned an atmosphere that contained no free oxygen into one in which one molecule out of every five is oxygen. As a result, animals could breathe oxygen and live, and an ozone layer could form to protect all life from the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation. Could this remarkable array of circumstances be accounted for simply by random chance? When confronted with the astronomical odds against a living cell forming by chance, some evolutionists feel forced to back away. For example, the authors of Evolution from Space, Hoyle and I can't pronounce this other name, <laughs> they give up saying, these issues are too complex to set numbers to. They add, there is no way in which we can simply get by with a bigger and better organic soup as we ourselves hoped might be possible a year or two ago. The numbers we calculated above are essentially just as unfaceable for a universal soup as for a terrestrial one. Hence, after acknowledging that intelligence must somehow have been involved in bringing life into existence, the authors continue, Indeed, such a theory is so obvious that one wonders why it is not widely accepted as being self-evident. The reasons are psychological rather than scientific. Thus, an observer might conclude that a psychological barrier is the only plausible explanation as to why most evolutionists cling to a chance origin for life and reject any design or purpose or directedness, as Dawkins expressed it. Indeed, even Hoyle and Rickamensinji, I can't re really pronounce that name, after acknowledging the need for intelligence, they still say that they do not believe a personal creator is responsible for the origin of life. In their thinking, intelligence is mandatory, but a creator is unacceptable. Do you hear the contradiction? Now, if spontaneous beginning for life is to be accepted as scientific fact, it should be established by the scientific method. And the scientific method has been described as follows. First, observe what happens. Second, based on those observations, form a theory as to what may be true. Third, test the theory by further observations and by experiments. And last, watch to see if the predictions based on the theory are fulfilled. In an attempt to apply the scientific method, 
it has not been possible to observe the spontaneous generation of life. There is no evidence that it is happening now, and of course, no human observer was around when evolutionists say it was happening. No theory concerning it has been verified by observation. Laboratory experiments have failed to repeat it. Predictions based on the theory have not been fulfilled. With such an inability to apply the scientific method, is it honest science to elevate such a theory to the level of fact? On the other hand, there is ample evidence to support the conclusion that the spontaneous generation of life from non-living matter is not possible. One has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task, Professor Wald of Harvard University acknowledges, to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. But what does this proponent of evolution actually believe? He answers, yet here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Does that sound like objective science? British biologist Joseph Henry Woodgard characterized such reasoning as simple dogmatism, asserting that what you want to believe did in fact happen. How have scientists come to accept in their own minds this apparent violation of the scientific method? The well-known evolutionist Lauren Isley conceded, after having chided the theologian for his reliance on myth and miracle, Science found itself in the unenviable position of having to create a mythology of its own, namely the assumption that what, after long effort, could not be proved to take place today had, in truth, taken place in the primeval past. Based on the evidence, the spontaneous generation of life theory appears better to fit the realm of science fiction rather than science fact. Many supporters apparently have forsaken the scientific method in such matters in order to believe what they want to believe. In spite of the overwhelming odds against life originating by chance, unyielding dogmatism prevails rather than the caution normally signaled by the scientific method. Not all scientists, however, have closed the door on the alternative. For example, Physicist H.S. Lipson, realizing the odds against a spontaneous origin for life, said, The only acceptable explanation is creation. I know that this is an anathema to physicists, as indeed it is to me, but we must not reject a theory that we do not like if the experimental evidence supports it. He further observed that after Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, Evolution became, in a sense, a scientific religion. Almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit in with it. A sad but true commentary. Chandra Rikramasinghe, professor at University College Cardiff, said, from my earliest training as a scientist, I was very strongly brainwashed to believe that science cannot be consistent with any kind of deliberate creation. That notion has had to be very painfully shed. I am quite uncomfortable in the situation, the state of mind I now find myself in. But there is no logical way out of it. For life to have been a chemical accident on earth is like looking for a particular grain of sand on all the beaches and all the planets in the universe and finding it. In other words, it is just not possible that life could have originated from a chemical accident. Biologist Edwin Conklin quotes, the probability of life originating from accident is comparable to the probability of an unabridged dictionary resulting from an explosion in a printing shop. <laughs> Astronomers Fred Hoyle and N.C. Wickramasinghe, oh goodness that name, they quote, 
If one is not prejudiced either by social beliefs or by a scientific training into the conviction that life originated spontaneously on the earth, the simple calculation, the mathematical odds against it, wipes the idea entirely out of court. So, Wickramashingi concludes, there is no other way in which we can understand the precise ordering of the chemicals of life except to invoke the creations on a cosmic scale. Astronomer, physicist, and cosmologist Robert Jastro quotes, scientists have no proof that life was not the result of an act of creation. 